Big round of applause. Peter Sage, everyone. <laughs> Welcome, Peter. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sam. And guys, let's give some love to our unsung hero for the MC, Stavros, today as well. Come on. Thank you, Stavros. All right, well, uh, I have to say I'm very impressed that uh, you've stayed this long. And I just want to say thank you very much for that. Uh, this is actually my first experience of Agile and an Agile conference. I wasn't quite sure what to expect, but I did get very excited when I started hearing the, the terms Scrum and Scrum Master because I'm a rugby fan. And of course, Rugby World Cup starts tomorrow, and I thought, wow, yeah, I'm going to be a, uh, among a bunch of rugby players and rugby fans. And I showed up today, and I'm like, most of these people don't look like rugby players. Mm -hmm. Some of you, but we won't go there. But yes, so uh, having sat in the audience for most of today and sort of absorbed a lot of what you guys are about, what you stand for, I'm thrilled because you're my kind of people. But what I'm not going to be doing as we close out today, because I know you've had a ton of information, as Stavros says, there's going to be no more PowerPoint. Yeah, I think you've had enough PowerPoint for today. Uh, because there's a huge difference, my friends, between information and transformation. And here's what I've learned in all of the years and decades that I've been doing this, and that is that Information guarantees only one thing, that you can sound smarter at a cocktail party. That's about it. It never translates into innovation, transformation, or change unless the person who is implementing that shifts first. Does that make sense? So unless you walk out of here slightly shifted in who you are and how you show up as a result of today, very few things will actually change. In fact, what tends to happen is you simply have more tools with which to execute the same behaviors that are an expression of who you are. So my role here as we journey over the next 45 minutes or so is not to give you more information. Trust me, you don't need it. What I'd like to do is invite you on a journey where it's a little bit of self-discovery, a little bit of addressing things that are very rarely addressed when it comes to events or conferences like this, and that is helping you become the best version of yourself. Not trying to implement the best version of a business plan or execute the best version of a project management team. No, because that all starts with who's looking in the mirror. And so I'll give you a little bit of brief background for those that don't know me. I'm really just to share that I'm, I'm a normal guy. Yeah, there's no difference between me being up here and you sitting down there apart from position uh, right now in, in different seats, that's all. But I dropped out of school of 16, um, 30 years ago this year, and you know, I had no formal qualifications. For me, school really taught me two things. It taught me how to pass tests and work for somebody else, and that was really never on my personal agenda back then in the UK. I uh, started my first company at 17. Uh, since then, I've had 24, 25 companies. Uh, some have failed majestically. You know, some have wiped me out completely. Some should have stayed ideas when I was drunk. And some have been global, international, you know, multi-million dollar success stories, and, and pretty much everything in between. And through that entire journey, I have done a lot, seen a lot, made a lot, lost a lot, and, and had a lot of fun. But I've also been passionate about one question. Right back when I, I discovered personal growth, personal development, when I was 17, and that was, why do some people who have pretty much all of the, the boxes ticked when they think of you know, resources, barely get the bat off their shoulder and take a swing at life. And then you have people who, by all accounts, would never or should never make it. You know, they don't have the right network, they don't have the right education, they don't have the right background, they don't have the right parents or access to capital or the best ideas or being in the best place at the right time. None of that. But they take the bat off the shoulder and knock it out of the park and the rest of us go, wow. You know, what is the difference that makes the difference in those kind of stories? And it's that that's been driving me for 30 years now to really sort of come to an answer and be passionate about human behavior. In fact, I'm doing a workshop tomorrow here at the conference in uh, one of the rooms on understanding human behavior in the workplace. So for those of you who are a little bit taken by some of the stuff that I share in the, in the limited time we have, want to drill down a little, uh, I'm going to be going into a little bit more of that and the practical applications of not only understanding ourselves, but understanding others at a deeper level. But I want to share essentially three keys with you today that will help go through and chunk down some of the aspects of what it requires to transform ourselves. And you may agree with a lot of the stuff I share today. That's cool. You may not agree with some of the stuff I share today. That's cool too. That's what makes things happen. But I did go after this information with a passion. 
And my sole objective here is not to worry about whether you do anything with it or not, or whether you agree with it or not. And if you'll permit me that frame, because if I worried about that, I'd then start to filter what I was going to say through whether I you know, worried about whether you cared about it or not. And as one of the things you're going to discover, it's a little bit less punchy, there we go. One of the things you're going to discover during this talk is that most of us are so inauthentic unconsciously because we're so worried about what we think other people think that we never get to express ourselves at our core the way that we should. And yes, there's cultural impositions, backgrounds, patterns that run in the, all of that stuff, and we'll get to that. But essentially, there's three areas that I want to share with you that I think will hopefully make a difference. And that, uh, the first one, really, the first key to understanding how we ourselves become the best versions of who we are is understanding or having a context for this incredible journey that we're on called life. Again, I'm not here to impose my model of the world onto anybody else. I've got no right to do that. But I do like to hold up a mirror to allow you to think certain thoughts that a lot of the time when we're busy being busy, we don't usually question. You see, Einstein said it beautifully. He said that the most powerful question that a person can answer in their lifetime is whether or not they live in a friendly or a hostile universe. Think about it. So if you think from the Darwinian perspective of survival of the fittest, you're always going to come from a fear-based men reaction mentality. Because everything out there can kill you and is trying to. Yeah, survival of the fittest, I've got to elbow my way through this evolutionary gene pool to try to stay ahead of the curve. Whereas on the other side of that, you know, if you believe you live in a friendly universe, then you start to have a different association to things that come out of left field. And for me, I'm what I call an inverse paranoid. I'm convinced that the entire universe is involved in a hidden and secret conspiracy to make me happy and successful. And so when challenges show up, I have a different relationship to them. And we'll discuss a few of the challenges I've had recently just to give you an idea on what's possible when you really drill down on this level of, of thinking. But the challenge is, especially with school, school rewards us for a very left-brain linear construct when it comes to relating to the world. Why? Because we're taught you know, information and we're questioned on it and whoever through their left brain can assess and sort that information and deliver the right answer and put their hand up gets rewarded. And we tend to carry that left brain dominance through into how we react into the world. But life is a subjective experience. Have you noticed that? In fact, I'll go so far as to say that the only thing you can do in life is experience. And if you want to take it one step further, the only thing that you can experience is the act of experiencing. Everything else is noise in the outer world that we make sense of and experience. Does that make sense? So, for me, if you understand that the journey to emotional maturity is not correlated with biological maturity. Do some of us know people that are, let's just say, emotional teenagers running around in very adult bodies. So when you understand life is a subjective experience, you realize that we're actually in on a journey of emotional maturity. There's two key factors along that that I've noticed that separate those who essentially grow up versus those that don't. The two key defining points in the human psyche, in the evolution of the human psyche, that delineate our ability to grow up emotionally. Now the first one, is where we finally come to terms with being okay, not being liked. How many people just cringed? <sighs> oh no. Becoming okay, not being liked. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you don't care about what other people think, that's different. What I'm saying is that when you come out of being driven specifically by what I call goop, most people spend their entire life swimming in goop, G-O-O-P, the good opinion of other people. Have you noticed that? When you can let go of that, you can start to have social freedom and express your level of authenticity. But if you are driven by goop, you're never going to be anything that's close to authentic because you're always filtering through, oh, well, if I behave this way, then they'll like me, or if, if I do that, then they won't. So all of that game's going on, mainly unconscious. But I want to share just an, an insight with you. Again, I like to use metaphors because it's easy for us to relate to. But I tend to think that we're all starring in the movie of our life. I think that would be a fair assumption or a fair, uh, easy metaphor to, to use. And I know you guys are all starring in the movie of your lives. Do you know why? 
because you're the only ones that are in every single scene of the movie of your life, are you not? Now, if you look around in your movie that you're experiencing as your life, then there are two other kinds of people that show up. If you're very lucky, you'll have a group of supporting cast. Parents, spouse, you know, co-workers, you know, all of those kind of people. But the vast majority of people that are starring in your movie, or that come into your movie, should I say, are nothing more than what? Film extras. Is that you, sir? Did you say that? Extras. Fabulous. Look at that. I love rewarding people who participate. So this is a copy of my latest book. And um, I, I'm not here to plug it, so I won't say that it's the fastest way to change your life, and it's available on all good bookstores. So, but no, uh, that's an incredible book. And I say thank you for that. Give me a little bit later, and I'm happy to sign it for you. Give me a hand, guys. Thank you. Yeah, the vast majority of people in our movie are film extras. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Just because we see ourselves as the star in our movie, we make the assumption, the false assumption, that everybody else sees us as what? Star in our movie. No more books, guys. Sorry, but you can, you can, yeah, you can answer. They see us as the star of our movie. But guess what? They're not starring in our movie. What movie are they starring in? Their own. So by definition, what are we mostly? A film extra in their movie. In other words, and please listen to me, especially if you guys are driven by goop because it's a ghost, and that is that most people don't care enough about you to bother to give an opinion because they're too busy being worried about what they think you're thinking of them. Correct. Like, wake up. Nobody cares. They're too busy saying, oh my God, I wonder what they're thinking of me. Well, they're not thinking anything of you. They're too busy thinking, I wonder what they're thinking of me. We're all walking around in this bubble of our own reality, thinking that everybody sees us as the star of our own bubble. And they don't. But the good opinion of others and being driven by that is a, a fast track to really being crippled when it comes to our potential and being the best version of ourselves. So the first step in emotional maturity is being okay not being liked. And we see so many examples of the negative effects of that in terms of not being able to let go of it in society today. In fact, we're building a culture, especially in the universities, and this is far more towards North America uh, that I see or experience, but we're building, you know, you've heard of the snowflake culture. The culture that we tend to be building here is a culture of, oh, I'm easily offended. Have you noticed that? Oh, we can't do that in case we offend them. In fact, somebody told me a joke the other day. They, uh, they said, oh, walking out of the, uh, the supermarket, and all of a sudden they started shouting, broccoli, cauliflower, broccoli. And someone says, oh, don't worry, he's suffering from florets, which uh, for English people would probably get that joke, because churettes is where you can't stop swearing. Uh, and said, so, oh, no, we can't, we can't sell, tell jokes like that now in case it offends people who have churettes. I'm like, give me a break. No. Far better to teach people to have enough self-esteem and backbone that no matter what you say to them, they'll never get offended. Why? Because if you try to control the outer world in a way that puts you in bubble wrap, I've got news for you. You're missing the entire point, which brings me on to the second part of the journey of emotional maturity. The first is where we finally become okay not being liked, and the second is when we realize or come to the awareness that life is a growth-centric experience not a comfort-centric experience. Now, the day we wake up and we own that, we realize that, the game changes so much. Why? Because if you think you're living in a comfort-centric experience, which is a utopian 20th, 21st century yeah, model that's been imposed on us because we're the first pretty much generation in human history that's had food certainty, and most of the stuff that we've been worried about since the dawn of civilization, we don't have to worry about anymore, predominantly war for most people, famine for most people, drought. Would you agree? No. What are we worried about now? We're worried about the fact Starbucks has run out of caramel sauce. You get the idea. So when you realize that life is a growth-centric experience, let's go to the physical world. There's some clues here. Anybody train in the gym? Any health people out there? A few of you guys? Cool. Bear in mind, if you don't make time for health, you'll have to make time for illness. Just a little uh, reminder there for those that are still yeah, thinking that they're invincible. 
So if you go to the gym, we go to the gym and we train, what happens if you push the body past its limits? It's pre-programmed to return with a better version of itself. We don't get to change that. It's part of the rule set. You don't do, you know, guys get in the gym and they pick up the dumbbells and they're like, yeah, really ripping it out. And after an hour, they go back to the change rooms like, oh, wow, that was amazing. I gave everything there, but whew, I wonder if my arms will grow. What if they decide not to today? No, we don't have that conversation. We know that if we put in that level of work, the rules state that if you break down the muscles in a certain way, they will rebuild stronger. They'll recruit amino acids out of the diet and they will respond in a positive way. Now, we are all in a growth-centric experience. The problem is the mental gym is the same. The spiritual gym, the emotional gym is the same. If we're here to grow, then what we perceive in the physical world as a workout, in the non-physical world, we call them challenges. You notice that. But if life, if you live in a friendly universe, life is your personal trainer not some sadistic masochist that gets off on you know, making you throw up on the treadmill in the emotional world. No. But if you don't know that, what are you going to do? If you're living in a growth, uh, sorry, in a comfort-centric world, you're going to seek to resist the growth-centric opportunities. In other words, let's take the example back in the physical world. If, you're a, you know, if you walk into the gym, but you don't know that you're an athlete, then you're going to hide from that guy that keeps telling you to start doing press-ups. You're going to start resenting him saying, get on the treadmill, we've got another 5K to run. You're like, who is this guy? He must hate me. But if you're an athlete, you have a different relationship. You know, you're here to get the medal. You, you can't wait to get into the gym. In fact, if you're not throwing up in an hour, you want your money back, right? So when you realize that life is a growth-centric experience, we start to see our challenges from a very different perspective because you cannot grow unless you are challenged. See, my friends, that the strongest trees don't grow in the best soil. They grow in the strongest winds. And so if we really want to live our potential, if we really want to give our gift of who we are to the world and become the best version of ourselves, start praying for some strong winds and don't bitch about them when they show up. Well, what do most of us say? Oh, you're not going to believe what happened to me. And oh, if only that wouldn't happen. Again, once we know that life is a growth-centric experience, we have a different relationship to it. I had a, uh, what I call a graduation event. Now, the, the frame that I have for this incredible journey is, is I call Earth School. I believe we're in Earth School. We're here to learn. We're here to learn and grow. Why? Because if you go to nature, it operates on two laws, growth and contribution. Everything in nature grows and contributes or it's taken out of the food chain. We just think we're different, especially if you've got a comfort-centric mindset, which life will usually slap you out of, by the way, consistently. So uh, if you realize that uh, growth and contribution, in order to be able to grow, we need to get challenged. And every so often, just like in school, we'll have what I call a graduation event. I had one a couple of years ago. And that was, I was arguing a, a business deal in court uh, with a, a major multinational. We'd uh, done some business about six years before when I was living in Dubai, uh, I bought, yeah, millions and millions of dollars worth of goods, paid for it in full, resold it, small margin, and several years later, they knock on my door with a freezing order suing me for $17 million. I'm like, what? What is that about? Anyway, it transpired that you know, they just didn't like the fact that I'd sold it, even though I hadn't got any restrictions on, on doing so, and they wanted a little bit of the profit that I'd made, and so you know, they offered a settlement. I said, no, that's financial bullying, and they then put in a contempt of court application saying that I breached the freezing order. I'm like, I haven't breached the freezing order. And I looked at how they constructed it, and it was fairly intelligent. And so I thought, I'll just show up in court. I'll explain everything, because no judge in his right mind is going to even entertain that for more than five minutes. And let's just say I learned a lot about how the court system works. If you think that the court's about right and wrong, you're in Disneyland. <laughs> it's about who can hire the best storytellers. It's a massive difference between content and context because the agenda is how do we win, not how do we do what's right. And if you want to see true leadership in a company or an organization, a team, those leaders are the people that come from a place of how do we do what's right, 
not how do we cut corners to achieve our goal. Would you agree? So I ended up walking into court, yeah, and a little while later, just gives me six months in prison as the only non-criminal. It's not a criminal matter. Never been arrested, never been accused of a crime, still don't have a criminal record. It's one of those quirks in English law where, you know, for contempt of court, you can actually go away. And sends me to the most violent prison in England as a non-criminal, full of terrorists, drug dealers, yeah, um, rapists, arsonists, murderers. And when it looked like it was going the wrong way, my fiance turns around and says, why is this happening? And I'm like, well, I don't know, honey, but here's what I do know. You know I've been very blessed over the last 25 years or so that millions of people around the world have benefited from my work in one way or another. But maybe the people that I could really help the most never get to see or get exposed to my work because they're in somewhere like jail. If the universe, whatever you want, sends me in, remember, I live in a friendly universe. I'm starring in the movie of my life here, and I says, I'm not going in as a prisoner. I'm going in as a secret agent of change. And so that's what happened, and I went down. And I started getting excited. In fact, the, I got there, and I got given my clothes by the prison officer. And he said, um, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He says, um, are you a policeman? I'm like, no. And <laughs> Please don't give me that label. Yeah, <laughs> walking in here. Not good for life expectancy. And anyway, so I got, I'm waiting to be processed. And this is all new to me, and I'm, 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 I'm having fun. I mean, as far as I am, one of the first letters that I wrote to my coaching clients, I said, listen, guys, don't worry about me. Yeah, I'm, I'm starring in the movie of my life. And what kind of movie do you want to star in? Let me ask you this. Would you pay good money to go watch James Bond rescue a kitten out of a tree for 90 minutes? No. What makes a superhero, guys? It's not superpowers. It's that they face a supervillain. That's what defines a superhero. It's a supervillain. And most of you have got supervillains in your life, but you're resisting it if you're coming from a comfort-centric experience. So, and I said to them, I said, hey, listen, yeah, when I finish the final scene of the movie of my life, which we all will at some point before we go on to the next movie, or whatever your belief system, I want to finish, and if I'm lucky enough to have the last words come out of my mouth and be able to choose that, I'd want it to be something like, wow, now that was a movie I would watch again. And what makes a great movie? Everything. You've got drama, and intrigue, and comedy, and tragedy, and romance. That's the kind of movie I want. And the first letter I wrote to my coaching client says, hey guys, don't worry about me. I'm just on location for six months filming the prison scene in my movie. And as I'm in the waiting room waiting to be processed, I go into the medical. And the doctor, after five minutes, turns around and says, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He says, are you undercover? <laughs> and I said, you're the second person that's asked me that. Why? He says, in my entire career as a prison doctor, I've never seen anybody so happy on their first ever day in prison. <laughs> and, you know, and then I, I essentially went to work because I knew why I was there. And you know, long story short, over the six months, I, I was very blessed to say that you know, I helped get most of the wing off drugs. I, I was stopping suicides. I uh, was reducing the violence between wings. I put in a protocol that's now being rolled out across prisons in the UK and the rest of the world that are helping you know, thousands of prisoners every month. And yeah, I won a national award while I was in there for the work that I was doing to help. And uh, it became one of the most incredible, inspiring, and you know, memorable adventures I've ever had the privilege of living. And of course, when I came out, you know, the multinational HP, they dropped all of the uh, uh, initial allegations, as I knew they would. But I was, I was amazed. I'm like, wow, I can't believe how intelligent my personal trainer is that found the only way in law to smuggle me into prison without ever being accused of a crime, allow me to do my work, and then smuggle me out again without even having a criminal record. Genius. See, that's what's available when you have an empowering model of the world. But if you come from a growth, a, a, a comfort-centric method, you're going to go in and resist. You're going to go in and complain. You're going to use it to beat yourself up into a victim mode. And that's really one of the next things, or one of the next keys that I want to share with you is, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship, which, again, I've, yeah, I think the last job I had was in a supermarket when I was 16 and a half. Uh, since then, I've been completely unemployable. Uh, because that's the nature of an entrepreneur, that's what I do. But one of the key factors of becoming a, a successful entrepreneur or manager or leader or human being 
is the ability to handle uncertainty. Not how many degrees you've got on the wall, not how many gold stars you get on your reviews, but your ability to handle uncertainty. Why? Is uncertainty going to show up? It's guaranteed. There is no certainty in life. The only difference, again, is the tree doesn't stand there worrying if it's going to get blown down by a storm tomorrow. It just deals with what happens as it happens. And I had an experience many years ago that taught me a lot about handling uncertainty. And um, if you'll permit me a few minutes, I, I wouldn't mind sharing it. But before I do that, I do need to ask a question. I've seen a lot of people here, and I've been interacting in, uh, all day with people. And I've noticed that some of you are, if you don't mind me saying, a pretty crazy bunch. So I'm expecting a few hands to go up to this question. How many people here have ever had the experience of jumping out of a perfectly good airplane while it was moving? Okay, one, one? Okay, one person on drugs. There we go. <laughs> okay, I'm talking about skydiving. And I, I love to skydive. You know, I've done a few hundred jumps now you know, all over the world. Uh, I do it to relax. It's, it's a lot of fun. And yeah, just lie on your back for 10,000 feet and sunbathe. Nothing quite like it. But my first jump taught me a huge amount. In fact, taught me more in 60 seconds about handling uncertainty than I'd ever learned in business. And I remember, I went to, uh, I grew up in England. Any people from England in the house? Okay, so I'm sorry about that. And, uh, I, I'm a sunshine guy. Yeah, I grew up in England, yeah, Leicester. Leicester City is my hometown. I never saw the sun until I was 12. <laughs> right? I now live in Tenerife. Yeah, there's a reason I lived in Dubai for six years. Yeah, there's a pattern here, right? Yeah, I like the sun. Yeah, and I just woke up one day and asked myself a quality question. You know, if I'm lucky enough to be living in a time in human history where we can choose where we want to live, where would it be? And Leicester didn't make my top 10. So, I, I live in uh, Tenerife, but I, I wanted to go out and skydive. And you can't skydive in England because it's just cloud bases, 2,000 feet, pretty much 360 days of the year. So, I went over to Florida and guaranteed sunshine, and I thought, can't be that difficult to do skydiving, surely. Why? Because gravity does all the work. Pretty simple. I'm not academically qualified. I mentioned that. I didn't do very well in school. I'm not you know, book smart. But I got there, and I thought, right, jump out of an airplane, pull a cord, and just let gravity do everything else. Pretty cool. Pretty simple. What a great idea. I was not prepared for how much work was involved. Just like a lot of the time where we go and say, oh, that sounds like a great project to start. That's a great idea to move forward with. And then you start realizing how much you didn't know when you show up. And I walked in there, and my first day, it was eight plus hours of ground training. And it was overwhelming. It was all about your equipment, all about what it could do, what, it, you know, what happens if it goes wrong, what your actions on drills are, all about aerodynamics and understanding wind patterns, plane entry procedures, exit procedures, hand signals in the air, radio call signs, landing drills. I mean, it was, whoa. Anybody know what I'm talking about uh, in terms of like, you know, we go into a project and we thought, oh, okay, didn't realize you know, what was involved. And the challenge is the emotional route tends to be overwhelm, which leads to confusion, which leads to inaction. In other words, like you know, some of the conferences we can go to, you learn so much that you do what? Nothing. So I was kind of getting my head around that. I walk out, it's like the end of the first day, and I'm, I've got massive uncertainty, and I'm trying to make sense of all of this data that has been coming in. And you know, if you get something wrong in a team meeting, no big deal. Yeah, if you get something wrong in skydiving, there's slightly more consequences. Yeah, we call it bouncing, technical term. So, yeah, a lot at stake, and therefore I'm going. All I want to do is go back to my hotel, review my notes, try to make it sink in, and then tomorrow we're going to go and do our jump, first one. And I'm just leaving the drop zone, and my instructor comes running out and says, "Hey, Peter!" I says, "Wait, wait!" He says. There's one slot left on the last load. It's called the sunset load. It says, I got us on it. <laughs> Oops. And again, you probably notice that sometimes life has got plans for you to push you out of your comfort zone to teach you that it's not a comfort-centric experience, whether you like it or not. And so I, I go back in, and I put my, my jumpsuit on, put on my rig, and we get onto the plane. Now, on your first jump, this is under United States Parachute Association rules and regulations, but it's fairly standard across the world. On your first jump, 
you're not tied to somebody like a tandem. You jump with two instructors, and they stand at either side of you, and they jump out together, and they give you hand signals, and you work off hand signals, and you know, I guess if you forget to pull your cord, they'll remind you. So anyway, we get on, and there's like 30 other skydivers. You know, all, everybody loves the sunset load because it's beautiful out there. And we get on, and I'm sitting here. I've got my two instructors here, 30 other experienced skydivers all excited, and one other guy who's also his first jump. He's sitting down here, and he's sitting here like this. <laughs> he's white, right? I don't think he's breathing. Engines kick in, we start hurtling down the runway, the plane takes off, and we start circling up to altitude. We get to, we're in, working in Fix, we're in the US, you know, we get up to about 10, 12,000 feet. You know, it's like a couple of kilometers above the clouds. And all of a sudden, the red light comes on, which means stand by. And you can feel the excitement rippling through all the other skydivers. They're doing kit checks and giving thumbs up and all shuffling. And I look over at the other guy, still not breathing. And then the green light comes on and the door opens and this icy blast comes in and all of a sudden these skydivers all get up and start getting animated. They go to the door and they're jumping out and they're backflipping and high-fiving and into the abyss, gone. Crazy bunch. And it's just me and this other guy and our two instructors each left in the plane. Anyway, he's nearest the door, so he's going first and I'm happy with that. <laughs> he gets up and his entire body language is screaming, no F way. And he's like this, like dead man walking. And he gets to the doors, and he, he climbs up, and he holds on for dear life, and his knuckles are white. And the instructor says, it's the legal question on your first jump, for insurance purposes, you've got to say that you're actually ready. So he says, are you ready to skydive? And the guy's like this. <laughs> Nothing. This guy goes, are you ready to skydive? Anyway, he gets up, he unpeels his fingers, he closes his eyes, he takes a breath, and he jumps back inside the plane. <laughs> and they sort of calm him down, and they get him sort of like, you know, they're, they're professionals, they've done this before, and you know, they get him reset, and they get him breathing, and they give him some confidence, and anyway, of course, now it's, this is it, it's all set. Okay, and he goes up, and he gets there, and his body language is better this time, right up until the point he looks out. He's like, <gasps> And he goes, are you ready to skydive? Now, we're almost overshooting the drop zone at this point. So I'm thinking, I've got visions of me landing in you know, Alabama somewhere at this point. <laughs> uh, and of course, again, same thing, nothing. And so for the final time, this guy instructs this, John, says, are you ready to skydive? And he looks up, and he unpeels his fingers. He looks at each instructor, and he goes above the engines. He goes, no, no, no. And this guy goes, what was that? Go, go, go. And they throw him out. And they jump out after him. And I'm back here in my seat, I'm like this, I'm like... <laughs> and I look at my other two instructors and I'm like, but, but, but did, you, did, you, did you see the... Did, did, guys, did you see that? And they calm down, they're like, well, yeah. I'm like, but, but, but why did they do that? And I'll never forget what they said. They said, well, it's, it's quite simple, really. You, know? you don't jump, we don't get paid. There are certain moments in life <laughs> where, where it's only ever going to be a one-way ticket. Yeah. And yeah, that can happen at so many different levels. And yeah, this is what happened next. We're at literally yeah, 13 odd thousand feet. I've never jumped out of a perfectly good aeroplane. Yeah, I've got eight hours of brain fry that my life depends upon rem remembering. Yeah. And yeah, I've never flown a canopy. And the only two people I'm left in the plane with have a financial incentive for throwing me out. I mean, it's, you, just, you just don't know where this is going. It's like, you know, it's either going to be a really good day or a really bad day. But, you know, either way, it's going to happen. So we're, like, we're, at, we're at 13 on 1,000 feet. I go, oh, okay, come on, Pete, I can do this. It's like, oh, that's a long way down. No, come on, get in state, get in state. Come on, yes, remember what they taught you. Just relax, everything's all good. You know, what's my first step? He says, are you ready to skydive? I'm like, he's having a laugh. <laughs> like it makes a damn difference, right? Uh, 
Now come on, Pete, I can do this like ready. Okay, ready, ready, ready. This is it. One, two, three, and go. Okay, and I'm falling. Here we go. And steady, steady, steady. And yes, stabilizing, stabilized. Here we are. Instructor one, visual check. Instructor two, visual check. Hand signal. Hand signal is arching more. Arching more here. Hand signal here. Relax. <laughs> Relax. Here we go. Okay, altimeter. You know, we're at 10,000 feet and falling here. Practice ripcord, Paul. Here we go. And one, locking on now. Six and a half thousand feet. Falling, falling, falling. This is it, guys. Ready? One, two, three, and waving off. And I'm Pulling and go, <gasps> please open, please open, please open. <laughs> and I went from 120 miles an hour to 15 miles an hour in three seconds. And I learned a huge amount in that experience, which they didn't teach me in class, which is that the most important factor is to get your straps right. <laughs> but I was under canopy. And <laughs> And now I'm flying, and I'm falling down, and it's, it's, it's like beautiful and uh, serene, and I, I, I came into the drop zone, and I hit the, the, the landing spot perfectly, and it was like, it was this incredible, you know, liberating experience. And I, I gathered up my chute, and I put it over my shoulder, and I'm walking to the aircraft hangar. And all of a sudden, something hit me. Oh, and I saw the other guy, another guy they pushed, he was there too. He had this big smile, probably because he was alive. <laughs> and as I'm walking into the hangar, all of a sudden, I get this awareness. It changed my life. I'm like, hang on, whoa, 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 what just happened? You see, when I was sitting in the plane, what emotions do you think I was experiencing? Fear, anxiety, overwhelm, confusion, all of that stuff. The second I left the plane, everything shifted. Overwhelm, pff, gone. Anxiety, no. Nah. Fear? Left it in the plane. Why? I'm falling. I'm in it. My question is, when was the last time that a business opportunity presented itself? A startup opportunity presented itself? You wanted to go and approach somebody who you've been admiring for a while, but you, know, you just fear rejection. And so you wait until you have enough courage, which is usually never. And the plane just flies on, and next thing the red light comes on, and you've overshot the drop zone, and it's never going to happen. When all you had to do was step out of the plane. And that was a massive thing for me. It was almost like, uh, I don't know here if it's a, a useful um, analogy. You're familiar with Scooby-Doo? Any Scooby-Doo fans in the house? Scooby-Doo! <laughs> yeah, that's the only impression you're going to get from me, by the way. Scooby-Doo, for those who don't know, it's the same plot theme every single episode. Yeah, it's a cartoon, and what happens, you've got, you, know, you pull up, the magic bus pulls up, and the gang gets out, usually in some old, you know, abandoned town, or little, like, sort of backwater village, and there's, like, a, a haunted mansion. And Scooby and Shaggy, they go running off to find food, because that's what they do. And all of a sudden, they come across this ghost, this big white ghost goes, woo, and they go, oh, my God! You know, and the legs are like, Brrr. And they go running off and they tell the gangs, oh my God, there's a, there's a ghost. And then the people in the village say, yes, it's haunted us for years. And it's always the smart girl, the one with the glasses. Yeah? Probably got an MBA. She always figures it out. And what happens is, as the ghost is running at one point past them, she grabs the sheet and she pulls it off. And you realize it's not actually a ghost. It's a little midget holding up two broomsticks. That's our fears. When we stop and turn around and we pull off that sheet, when we jump out of the plane, we realize that, whoa, 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 hang on, is that what I was afraid of? But if you don't do that and you keep running, it will chase you for a lifetime. And when we start to realize the power of facing our fears because it's only an internal game and when you know life is a growth-centric experience, you know, when you know that we're here to grow and contribute, not try to build ourselves into a, a comfort zone, start to understand that tentative is no power. In fact, I'll, I'll demonstrate. Here's a business example I'll finish with. Most people take, yeah, let's take um, the content of this bottle to be our liquid capital, should we say. Most people are very protective. And so we get presented with an opportunity, a, a vehicle to, uh, with which to invest our capital into. And what do most people do? <sighs> oh, I need to do double due diligence, SWOT analysis, everything else. And yeah, maybe I'll just try it a little bit. 
Yeah, just, just pour a little bit in, just in case. Now, ladies, when yeah, the guy comes up and he's super tentative and just kind of half asks you out, but it's not that serious, how do you feel? Eh, wrong, but thank you for playing. All right. But you know, maybe we get a little bit more comfortable, pour a little bit more in. It's like, oh, okay. Hang on. As long as nothing goes wrong, no ability to handle uncertainty, no guarantees in life. Right. And all of a sudden, pour a little bit more. Okay, a little bit more comfortable. And so we think, okay, that's that, that's kind of progressive, but you know, we're still very cautious because we have a belief system that's running that says, if my, if I lose my capital, especially for those whose self-worth and net worth are tied together, which is the worst thing you could ever do. See, I'm an entrepreneur. My net worth is going to go up. It's going to go down. So, you know, if we start getting tentative about how we give our gift and we play half ass at life because we feel that our self-worth and net worth are tied together, we're always going to be questioning, oh, should I move forward or not? We're focusing on what if, worst case scenarios. Because we think if our entire life turns upside down, it'll be over. But the reality is, guys, it never is, ever. We've got so much protection when we realize that life is a growth-centric experience that most of us are playing so safe because we have a flawed model of the world. Now, in all fairness, it doesn't really matter what I say for the next two minutes, because most of you are thinking, how the hell did I do that? <laughs> Come to the workshop tomorrow, I might tell you. Mm. <laughs> but no, when we understand that the only variable in this game, guys, is us. You have so much power, so much potential, and most of us sell it out because we're either listening to the mainstream media, which you know, I haven't listened to a newspaper uh, report, uh, uh, listened to a radio news broadcast or CNN, you know, constant negative news, yeah, for this year will be 17 years. I have no clue what's going on in the world. I've got every clue what's going on in my world. Yeah, I'm the star of the movie of my life and you're the star of the movie of your life. And as soon as you start accepting the scripts of what other people impose on their own agendas, you're gonna start selling out your potential. Start living from that place, win or lose. Now, at the end of the day, we're not going to take it with us, are we? Right? The only people that tried that were the Egyptians. And what happened? We dug it up and stole it. Right? So, you know, coming from a place of understanding life is a, you know, it's, it's an experience. It's a subjective experience. We're here to be able to have access to things like joy and fulfillment. And there's a massive difference between success or a life-chasing success and a life-pursuing fulfillment. Very, very different things. You know, two men sat behind prison bars, one saw mud, the other saw stars. Your environment, my friends, never defines you. You can't control that to a large extent. It only defines yeah, who you are as a result of your environment. And that's the invitation for conferences like this, for us to be able to go out and give the best of who we are. And if we can do that, if we can start to engender and inspire by example and invitation, not imposition, if we can focus on becoming the best versions of who we are for the people we serve, whether it's our family, our friends, our co-workers, our employees, or even the managers who look down to us, then we can start having a whole different relationship to this incredible movie called Life. And at the time that adversity shows up, as it will, at the time where your next opportunity shows up, as it will, don't run the same patterns of limitation that a comfort-centric illusion will give you. Instead, step up, know that the universe has got your back, smile, and jump out of the plane. Thank you. Thank you. I know we have time for questions. We may have to get close on the mic. Thank you, Peter. I'll take one or two. Any questions, any comments, any, any expressions, any? Just raise your hand really high so I can see it. Anyone actually listening? There you go, we got a question up there. I'm gonna come to, I'm gonna jump from the plane and Thank you. Uh, could
Could you tell us a bit about your experience in prison? Like what pick, what kind of people you met? Who who you will always remember? Those kind of things. Any thoughts? Whatever you would like to say. And how did you deal with the bullies? Thank you. One of the things in terms of the mindset that I went in with, and I wrote in the very first letter, in fact, the book that I, I handed to the gentleman uh, down here is actually a copy of the 11 letters that I wrote to my senior coaching clients. And they're meant to be private letters. It was never meant to be a book. And it was essentially showing them how I was dealing with that experience, what I call the graduation event. And it shows a lot of the techniques I was using, a lot of the tools, a lot of the um, uh, sort of trade craft. Um, I was very vulnerable. It showed the times that I cried, the times that I, you know, I was you know, around a lot of violence. Three deaths in one week was the worst week I was there. Uh, I mean, this is to say it's the most violent prison in England. But I never once felt in danger because I went in with an, a mindset of knowing that I was there to serve, not there to protect myself. I was there to add value, not you know, sort of try to be tough. You know, I, I was living in a, a completely different movie script to most of the prisoners, and one of the things that I was doing with most of the prisoners um, was teaching them different tools and techniques. In fact, the first thing that I taught them was how to get to a place of acceptance, because so many of us resist what we can't change, or worse, what's already happened. And if you're resisting something that's already happened, you're a fool, because you can't go back and change it. Yes, the milk may have spilled on your new carpet, Yes, you may have lost your job. Yes, your partner may be filing for divorce. You can't change what has already happened, so resisting that is a waste of energy. Instead, coming to a place of acceptance, which is a very powerful place, not apathy, not reluctance, not resignation, not like, oh, well, not in charge, none of that, no. From a place of, I accept where I am, I've come to complete terms with it, now the energy that I was putting into resistance, I can free up and channel into what's the next best move to deal with what's happened. Yeah, on how we clean it up, or how we you know, deal with the divorce, or how we you know, uh, file an appeal, or how we learn the lessons that we learned that put us in jail in the first place, all of that stuff. But acceptance versus resistance is, is hugely powerful. Another thing that I was teaching the, that the prisoners was the difference between liberty and freedom. Because the only thing that had happened is they'd reduced my liberty. That's all. You know, I was in a smaller space. I couldn't decide or didn't have a, a bigger level of decisions that I would have if I was out because my liberty had been restricted. You know, I couldn't choose to go to the shops, I couldn't choose to you know, walk my dogs, and I couldn't choose to show up for my wedding that had been planned and paid for. Yeah. Turns out to be a good thing, but that's another story. <laughs> right? Yes, I'm currently single. Anyway. Um, but no, so freedom is a state of mind. I was freer in my little cell than a lot of the prison officers who were coming into work that day that hated their jobs, or they were living in a dysfunctional relationship that they either didn't have the resources, tools, or the courage to change or face. Yeah, freedom is a state of mind. Yeah, remember, nobody can do anything to you emotionally without your permission. And again, I was on a mission. I, was, I had a great time. Now, yeah, I missed my dogs. But here's the thing. If you take someone like, again, let's, let's go to James Bond. Yeah, I'm a fan. Daniel Craig is a professional actor. His job is to show up the best in every single scene. That's what he does. Now, he's going to look at the next script, and then we know there's going to be scenes on there where he's on the beach with a Victoria's Secret model, and he's probably going to like those scenes. There's also scenes in the script where he's on location in the Arctic, under the ice, you know, with frogmen around, wrestling the baddie. That's just part of the, part of the game. So, you know, he's going to be away from his family, he's going to be cold, it's, and all of that stuff. His job is not to say, no, I only want to star in the beach scenes, otherwise don't give me a script. His job is to show up the best he can in every single part of that movie to be the best actor that he can be, correct? So, again, when I was there, I was dealing, I was just, you know, on location. Yes, I miss my dogs. You know, probably more than my fiancé. Right? But, no, I... I, 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 was, you know, I knew that I was there, and I was there for six months, and I was on location, and I was doing the best I could under those circumstances. And all of the violence around me was just part of the film extras in my movie doing what there was in their script. And yes, I became close to, to many of them. In fact, in the back of the book, you'll see several letters from many of the prisoners whose lives I, I was blessed enough to change, as well as letters from the prison officers, the um, uh, senior officers, even the governors. Uh, in terms of you know, commenting on all the work that I was doing in there. And in fact, one of the senior officers been in there for 27 years, turns around in the letter and says, uh, it, it feels really strange, but I wish he was here for longer. <laughs> <laughs> and
And I kind of miss parts of it. I really do. It was exciting. It was unique. It was different. And yeah, I wasn't on stage. There was no second takes. There was no cameras. There was no social media. There was no access to electronics, nothing. In fact, I wrote the vast majority of that by hand. And it really starts with the understanding, and I put this on the, almost the first page, that the number one law of personal growth is that theory doesn't cover the price of admission to the higher levels of greatness. Theory doesn't cover the price of admission to the higher levels of greatness. If you're a relationship expert, expect to have problems in your relationship so that you can prove you can walk your talk. If you're a health coach, expect to have a health challenge so you can prove you can walk your talk. Yeah, how you deal with the adversity when it shows up is the measure of who you are. Anyone can kick back when the sun's out on a yacht with a margarita, but when the storm clouds come and the wind picks up, we start to find out who we are. And most of every person in this room has been defined by yeah, the dark squares on the chessboard, not the light squares on the chessboard in our lives. Would you agree? And it's usually six months later where we say, yeah, I would, thank goodness that would have happened, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this now. My question is, if you know that in advance, why wait six months before you think it? <laughs>